Hey everyone, thanks for watching Test 2 Plus today. I'm Trace. This is a podcast style show where we take one topic and we break it down over five episodes. This is episode four of a five part series on space travel. So by now we've talked about when space travel first started. We've talked about some of the training that astronauts are gonna go through to get into the space program in the United States. We've talked about the setbacks of explosions and problems and people who died. You can watch all of those episodes pretty easily. But what makes space travel so difficult? is where we're gonna to go today. It's not just getting there. The problem with space travel isn't just getting to space. It's also, once you're there, keeping the people alive, keeping them sustained with food, oxygen, water. Many of those things have to be shipped up there and that is expensive. It's like $1,000 for every pound of gear to get it into space. That's a lot. But let's talk about spacesuits for a minute. Spacesuits are cool, you see them in movies, you think about them in, in books and comic books and things. A spacesuit is officially called an EVA. It's an extravehicular activity suit. It's technically the smallest spacecraft you could have, right? Because it's literally just on the other side of your skin. And it's a lot of stuff in there that could happen. And there are a lot of layers. There's no easy way to get in and out of a spacesuit. It takes some time. In 2013, an Italian astronaut almost drowned inside of his spacesuit while outside of the International Space Station. It was scary. One and a half liters of water were draining into his helmet and he literally almost drowned in space. He got inside in time, he got the helmet off, it was fine, but lots can go wrong. Especially considering there's a lot happening just in this EVA suit. There's also the mag, which is a maximum absorbency garment, which is literally, it's a diaper. So it's a diaper, but they're NASA. They can't just call it a diaper, it's called a mag. But you know, it's, it's just a diaper. So the mag isn't literally like a diaper like you would think of it for babies. It has what's called um, a sheath that you would put your penis into so that you would make sure that the urine in zero or microgravity goes where you need it to go, right? And there are three sizes. There's small, medium, and large. And none of the astronauts wanted to get a small. So they were all peeing wrong, essentially. So instead, they renamed them all extra large, immense, and unbelievable. And then people pick the right size usually, which is pretty amazing. There's also the liquid cooling for temperature regulation or the LCVG, because you'd think that space being cold, right? It's a cold, harsh vacuum. It's not actually inside of a spacesuit. it's pretty warm and your body heat heats it up. So they have this liquid cooling stuff, which is just tubes that run water along your skin to cool you down, not unlike a high performance computer. There are even fans inside of your spacesuit, which you have controls for, that you can move the air around and cool your face down. Although the thing that always bothered me about spacesuits when it came to fans and liquid rolling around your body is what if you get an itch? What do you do? Nothing because you're in a spacesuit in the middle of space. There's also the in-suit drink bag, which is sort of like one of those things you get on a backpacking trip. It's just a plastic thing with a tube, and it's filled with about 32 ounces of, of liquid so you can drink while you're out there. Because sometimes EVAs, when they're repairing things, can last a whole day, eight hours or more. There's also a wrist mirror. I know it doesn't sound that technical because it's not. It's literally a mirror on your wrist. Surrounded by all this technology, and yet we just put a mirror on their wrist so they can reflect the LCD panel that's on their chest and see what's going on with their spacesuit. Um, the stuff on the LCD is displayed backwards so that they can see it in the mirror. But that's just crazy to me. You have a mirror? Come on. But whatever. There's also the most interesting thing, I think, about these things is the gloves. Because everything hinges on your hands when you're in space, right? you want to make sure you can manipulate what you're doing. Imagine going into space and not being able to use your hands well. It's very difficult to make a cover for your hand that can protect you from radiation, keep you at the right temperature and the right atmosphere because hands can move in so many different ways. They have to be able to use tools. They have to be able to have fine motor skills. And sometimes it gets so difficult that the pressure that the astronauts are under and the the, the gloves themselves cause their fingernails to fall off. This is real. Half of the injuries astronauts reported from 2003 to 2004 were hand related because of the gloves in a lot of cases. Surprising. But aside from having an, a very complicated 
personal spacecraft like an EVA suit. There's also just the dangers of being in zero gravity or microgravity in general. So on the NASA website, you, there was a quote that says, gravity is not just a force, it's also a signal. A signal that tells the body how to act. And that is a really awesome way to describe gravity for the human body. Because if you think about it, you have never been outside of gravity, chances are. Maybe here and there on a roller coaster, or if you rode the vomit comet, maybe then. But for the most part, you have never been outside of the pull of gravity. And neither has almost anything else on our planet. They all evolved with that gravity pulling on them constantly. So once you put a human body into space, there's no gravity and things change. Blood circulation gets messed up. And in fact, in the first days in space, any new red blood cells that your body has made disappear. You lose 10 to 15% of the mass of your blood just going into space within the first few days. Also compromises the immune system for similar reasons. It's hard for the blood to get around your body and take what it needs to go where it needs to go. You also end up with muscle loss because without gravity, you're not using your muscles. Anybody who goes to the gym knows that they'll get bigger muscles if they work out those muscle groups. And if you're working out none of them, they're all gonna get smaller. There's also fluid shift, which is kind of disappointing for the astronauts and probably uncomfortable because without gravity pulling all of our fluids down, fluid gets evenly distributed throughout our whole meat sack and we end up with puffy faces and your eyeballs change shape and your legs get thinner and it's really weird. On top of that, that's just the short-term effect. The longer you're in space, the more your body adapts to that space. You lose bone density very quickly. You lose more muscle mass the longer you're there. So after one to six months in space, astronauts' muscle volume decreased by 13%, according to NASA research. And this is including their exercise that they're required to do every single day to try and keep that muscle mass. On top of that, astronauts in space are taller because the spine has little discs in between each of the vertebrae that without the gravity load, expand. So you end up just a little, little bit taller when you're in space, which might be kind of nice, I guess. There's also radiation. That's a big one. When you're on Earth, the iron core of our planet, which spins, creates a dynamo, which creates a magnetic field that keeps the sun's cosmic rays from hitting our planet quite as easily. On top of that, there are layers in the atmosphere, like the ozone layer that blocks some of that radiation, and all of that stuff protects us. But outside of the Earth's atmosphere, some of that stuff gets through. Radiation is measured in sieverts. One sievert is associated with a 5.5% increase in fatal cancers. And on Earth, we only get point, ready for this? Zero, 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 one sievert every day. It's like a millisievert. On a trip to Mars, a human will receive a whole body x-ray scan every five to six days. That's how many sieverts you get. That's a lot. It's a lot more. So even if we did overcome the short-term issues of getting to space and getting these EVA suits to work without drowning people and to get radiation blocked, which is very difficult. The Earth's atmosphere is like a one meter thick block of metal between you and the sun, really. And that's tough. You can't launch that into space. But even if we got over all that, if we wanted to stay up there for any length of time, we're going to have to figure out how to, you know, do it, which has never happened officially in space, by the way. There has never been a report of SpaceX, and they literally wear body monitors all the time. So they would probably know, though uh, no reports. Plus, blood flow is limited. Maybe that would impact your performance. I don't know. Um, but space masturbation, that may have happened. But we don't actually know that much about sex in space. We don't know how the human body or even if the human body can perform and procreate in space when it comes to this. And we will probably need to figure that out if we were going to go for any long period of time or try and colonize anywhere. Food in space is very difficult. Right now, it's shipped up. It would have to be, we'd have to figure out how to grow it. And that's very difficult because it requires a lot of space, a lot of nutrients, and a lot of other resources that we don't even know about, like, or that we don't need, humans. In the end, are we stuck in the past, do you think? Science fiction is all over space. They're colonizing planets, they're on spaceships for their whole lives, for generations at a time, but we don't know if any of those things are even possible. We don't know if you can bone in space, and that's kind of important when it comes to sustaining a population. But what do you think? Tell us down in the comments, and I'll be down there to talk to you about it too. 
<laughs> and also subscribe for more Test Tube Plus, and check us out over on iTunes if you'd rather listen to a whole thing, five episodes of Test Tube Plus in a row. You can go find us on iTunes by looking for Test Tube Plus, pretty easy. And if you like it, shoot us a rating. We'd really appreciate it. Check out tomorrow's episode by coming back here or subscribing again. And thanks for watching Test Tube Plus. Thank <laughs> you.